Hello, everyone, and welcome to Logic in Computer Science, session B5. Uh, we have a focus on some logical topics, including type theory and homotopy type theory and related matters. Um, we'll start right off. Our first speaker is Danny Greitzer, telling us about multimodal type theory and what's the subtitle, sorry. Go ahead, Danny, take it away. We're gonna have a brief presentation and then we'll have some questions. Do we have Daniel Great, sir? Multimodal dependent type theory, that's the title. He, he looks like he's talking, but I can't hear anything. Oh, perhaps he's muted. Nope. Danny Greitzer, we can't hear you. There he is. Uh, he doesn't appear to be muted, though. I see him. He's talking. But he's it's always muted. possible to mute yourself on the keyboard rather than using uh -huh. Zoom to do it. Who is our technical person? Can you tell us where That's the me. problem lies? I don't know. I think he, he may have uh, selected the wrong input device on his machine. In Zoom, he's not muted. But okay. now he's, oh no, he's still here. Okay, we're experiencing some technical difficulties. That was to be expected. Good to get them out of the way in the beginning. You wrote in the chat. Do you have seen it? Mm. On the off chance this worked? Yes. Yeah, you know. Okay. Great. I have no idea how that happened, but uh, cool. Great. Okay. Now take a deep breath and relax. Yes. Uh, let me uh, let me push my luck here and try and share my screen as well. Okay. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, now can uh, my slides be seen and can I be heard? Yes. All right, very good. So, uh, hi everyone. I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, multimodal dependent type theory. So, this is joint work with uh, myself, Alex Kapos, Andreas Neutz, and Lars Bechtel. So, the, um, the context for this work is uh, just normal dependent type theory. And in particular, how can we extend dependent type theory to be a more convenient language for reasoning about a variety of situations? So this, this is sort of something that arises both in the context of using type theory as a programming language and using type theory as a language for mathematics. So on the programming side, we have things like staged computation, which might be important for giving a sort of rational reconstruction of macros. We have guarded recursion to give us a more fine-grained approach to co-induction or parametricity, which is sort of a ubiquitous idea in computer science. In mathematics, we have other things where we'd sort of like to make type theory closer to a synthetic language for uh, dealing with things like geometry, uh, exotic computation, or topology. And in each of these cases, we have some new features that we'd like to add to type theory that allow us to you know, actually make use of this uh, novel interpretation. But if we just naively throw in features to type theory, we quickly destroy the character of type theory. If you just naively start adding things, you'll lose substitution, you'll lose decidability of type checking, you'll lose all of the things that make type theory type theory. So in these applications that I've listed here, uh, the idea is to use a sort of modality to, to capture the new features that you're adding and preventing them from running amok and destroying the rest of the system. So this has meant that there's been sort of an explosion in uh, modal dependent type theories. And sort of the general process seems to be we have a situation we design a modal type theory, and we prove some facts about it, and then we actually go and do what we meant to do. But this is a, it's a heavyweight process to build a new type theory and prove new theorems about it. So our contribution is a, uh, what we hope to be a more general uh, modal dependent type theory, which is not merely per, uh, like over some fixed collection of modalities that we have blessed for all time, 
Rather, the system is parameterized by a mathematical description of some modal situation. And the type theory can be uniformly instantiated with different modalities. And uh, in particular, you can prove results about our type theory, such as canonicity, independently of the particular choice of modalities in scope. And this gives us a sort of um, a, a nice way to uniformly recover theorems about a variety of modal dependent type theories. And to sort of test things out, we've instantiated our system to a few common situations, such as axiomatic cohesion and uh, cohes cohesive type theory, uh, guarded recursion, and parametricity. So I've included links to uh, both the preprint and the uh, much longer technical report. But um, I think I'll stop my brief presentation here. OK, thanks, thanks, very, thanks much. very much. I don't think we're going to bother with applause that we don't have enough time for such niceties. Let's go straight to the questions. The first question is coming from Slack. And um, it's, uh, I see, it's not Dan Jensen. He's the one who sent it on from Janlin Lee. And the question, maybe you want to read it yourself. I'll summarize. First of all, can you please give some examples of locks in the setting of later and box? He says mm. he's familiar with type theory and modal logic even, but uh, doesn't get the intuition behind the locks. So maybe you have an example that would help with that. Right. So I think semantically, you should just imagine locks to be the left adjoint to the modality and scope. So in, uh, in guarded type theory, the, uh, the later modality has a left adjoint, which is the earlier modality. So instead of having something one step later, you have it one step earlier. In a traditional modal logic, box also has a left adjoint, and that's the diamond modality, saying that uh, it's not necessarily provable at every world, but it's provable at some world. OK, I think that probably helps. Um, I mean, that's a little bit like uh, the box and diamond duality but it's a more refined version of it. Exactly, exactly. Okay, um, here's another question from Niels. I mean, uh, sorry, let me just go back. Uh, Jan Lin Lee, if you want a follow-up question, go ahead and just type it in. Um, Niels has a question, but since he's right here, I'll just let him ask it. Okay, I'll ask it. Uh, yeah, but the question ha had been answered in uh, the chat. But basically, my question was about uh, whether your work was strong enough to uh, uh, deal with the uh, clock type theory as described by uh, Mögelberg, Kratwall, and Barr. Right. Uh, so summarizing my, my answer there, it's, it's, uh, the answer is sort of not yet, but soon, I hope. So the, uh, the main thing that's missing is the ability to have MTT internalize the mode theory so as written right now the um mtt is sort of you you feed in a mode theory and then that collection of modalities is fixed throughout the type theory so the modalities don't change based on the context that you're in but in a clock type theory it's, it's rather crucial that they do because you have this clock quantifier which gives you new laters so uh we need some sort of internalized mode theory which is a little bit subtle in the presence of multiple modes but i think a very interesting question that we'd like to address Thank you. OK, so I think there was uh, another question here. It's a, so ev everyone begins their question by praising you. So I will just give you a kind of general praise rather than repeating all the praise. And then the question is, can you use this to support a linear calculus, something like right. Atkey's quantitative type theory or Benton's linear nonlinear? So the answer to that is no. As, as stated, MTT explicitly only deals with uh, structural type theories. There is a lot of work on some really interesting combinations of modalities and substructurality, and that's by Lakata, Shulman, Riley. Mm -hmm. the, the sort of uh, the penalty you pay, I guess, for being so general is that it's uh, it's difficult to uh, design a convenient calculus when you have uh, such generality. So MTT explicitly trades a little bit of that for gains in what we hope to be usability. OK, I think that's related to my question, which will be the last one. Um, the example you give is a, a co-monad rather than a monad. A monad is usually easy to do in dependent type theory because it can be, it can commute with substitution. But the co-monad yep. is delicate in that respect. The yep. solutions that I'm familiar with for doing that involve many zones or two or several zones in the contexts. 
Do you, um, are we still there? I'm still here. Okay, I've lost the Zoom feed here for some reason. Okay, anyway, uh, do you, uh, in your system, arrive at something like that, a zoned context thing, or can you relate your system to the zoned context versions of co-monadic modal type theory? So um, we don't explicitly have the same uh, split zones. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, those split zones sort of let you internalize like a, a functor type rule, mm -hmm. which says that if you have, you know, gamma and tails A, then you have F of gamma and tails F of A. Okay. So rather than that, we work with uh, transposition. So mm -hmm. when you're trying to construct F of A, you would instead have uh, the left adjoint applied to the context. All right. um, this is nicer for substitution. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit more restrictive because, of course, not everything is a right adjoint. Yeah. But uh, in the situations where it does apply, it tends to be a little bit more tractable, especially in the presence of multiple modalities where you, you, you'd be worried about a sort of combinatorial explosion. Of zones. Great. Okay. That answers my question. Thanks. Um, Thank any you. last quick question? If not, we'll move on. Okay. Let's have a round of applause for Danny here. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Nice talk. Thanks for the presentation to the video presentation. So Pierre-Marie is next. Russian constructivism in a pre-fascist theory. We're going in alphabetical order down the list of A, B, C, D, E, unless some reason comes up for us to deviate. So just so you know when you'll be up. Um, so is Pierre-Marie Pedro, I think, is here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Before. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Set up. Okay. And, uh, let's just fire away. Uh, the the title I said was Russian constructivism in a pre-fascist theory. It's a pun, so I'll let right. him tell you what the pun is. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, so essentially, this paper is about an alternative presentation of Prashiv's, uh, which is a very standard model of type theory but that is uh, defined in terms of usually of set theory or some, something that looks like sets like topoid. And uh, it turns out that if, if you want to do type theory uh, in, in this way, then you encounter technical problems related to convergence specifically. And uh, all the rage uh, that, has, that we've been working on has been trying to present a lot of models of type theory by means of uh, let's say, compilation uh, from a, a, a bigger type theory to a smaller type theory. And uh, the, the paper gives an alternative presentation of Prashiv's that works that way in terms of, of compilation, but that preserves the good intentional properties of the, uh, of the source type theory. And to do that, it relies on the notion of strict equality uh, as implemented in, in, in say, Cock and Acta, for instance. And uh, the, uh, the, resulting, the resulting model is equivalent in, term, in terms of one categories uh, to usual Prashiv's, but it's better behaved uh, internationally. So it, it gives a syntactic model uh, of Prashiv. And uh, a second part of the paper gives uh, an application of this theory, which is by composing this Prashiv interpretation together with uh, an exceptional mo uh, model, which essentially adds exceptions to type theory, uh, we can actually implement Markov's principle, uh, which says that every uh, maturing machine that doesn't loop terminates. Uh, and we give a computational interpretation of that uh, principle in a way that preserves all the good properties of type theory, namely uh, strong normalization, canonicity, decidability of type checking, so on and so, so forth. And that's about it. That's it? OK. OK. Good. Let's look at the chat now and see what, what questions have come in, or the Slack, rather. Um, OK, I'll start with a question. Um, you had, let me look up my question here. Uh, so I have one just a clarificatory question. Um, in the notation, and it seems to suggest that you're assuming the index category is always a pre-order or a post-set, is that an essential assumption in your no, setup no. or is that just for convenience? No, no, uh, we don't require that. The example we take is indeed a pre-order, uh, yeah. but it's, the model works for an arbitrary category. Okay. And then um, my next question is, you seem to uh, 
try to regain some of the convenience of having an extensional type theory by using this trick of having strict prop. And certainly I believe that you can get some of the benefits of extensional type theory using strict prop. What I'm a little bit unsure about though is what uh, are the drawbacks, the disadvantages of having strict prop. You say that it probably has canonicity. I don't share the intuition for the system that you do to give me the confidence in that. How sure are you that you have canonicity? Do you have a proof of that? Or is it still so with, obvious with, to you that you don't need to prove it? Or Well, we do need to prove it. Otherwise, that would be a, a bold claim without any, uh, any reasonable uh, support right. for it. Uh, so we're working on a proof of uh, for strong normalization that would also give canonicity in the same process. Um, the the reason for canonicity is, is that it's uh, is that there is no real reason uh, to break canonicity. Like it would be very surprising to to not get canonicity. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but indeed, the strong normalization is much more problematic because it's inconsistent with the predictivity. And in particular, we see that in the proof because the the, the usual arguments for, for strong normalization uh, doesn't go through as easily. Uh, it needs to be performed yeah. in a much more uh, contrived way. So uh, it might, I mean, I wouldn't bet. Uh, so to quote Thierry Coquin, uh, he bets that it's not strongly normalizing, uh, mm -hmm. but. That's but, my feeling too. Yeah. So I have a little bit of type theoretic intuition and mine says that this system is going yeah. to. Work, but, okay. Uh, I agree. But, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit excessive in some sense. Yeah. But it could still be that it has uh, canonicity without the strong normalization. So that'd be something. Right. I mean, you're you're saying you're going to prove canonicity from strong normalization, but maybe you can still get the canonicity some other way. Right. Uh, yeah. We can probably uh, we can probably obtain it in a more more straightforward way, I, I guess. Okay. Let's see if there's a, a another question. If not, I have one more. Okay. Um, oh, it's just a little comment in your paper maybe also in your presentation, you said something about hot adding infinitely many levels of equal equalities. It's not quite right to put it that way. Hot doesn't add anything. The pure Martin left type theory, the intentional theory has infinitely many levels of equality. Hot just recognizes that that is the fact and tries to understand it. The equalities are in there. We don't put anything in. So I don't really agree in the sense that it's it's like say bishop intu intuitionism. It doesn't take a uh, position neither for uh, towers of equality nor any, anything like k is perfectly compatible with the uh, MLTT. Uh, it's just that you, if you don't have any syntax to talk about it, then it could as well not exist. Whoa, 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 whoa! whoa. No, we have syntax to talk about. It. It's the identity type. I mean, I mean Martin Love type theory with identity types in the intentional system. That's, that system, pure Martin Luft type theory with identity types, has infinitely many levels of identity right. proof. Right, you can, you can always define, okay, that's, that's not what I meant when I said that, that it had an, an infinite towers. Like, the MLTT uh, is perfectly compatible with a set of interpretation that would collapse all the, uh, all the equality on, on singletons. Of course, you can also, you can always quotient the system by adding new stuff, but that doesn't mean it adds that new stuff. Adds, you know what I mean? adds something. It's like saying Martin Luff type theory is also compatible with the axiom of choice, but you wouldn't right. say it adds the axiom of choice. It's compatible with uh, excluded middle. Right. It's, but you wouldn't say it adds excluded middle. It, it's compatible with infinitely many levels of equalities, but you wouldn't say it adds so, infinitely many levels so, of So you equality. mean relatively hot uh, in the sense that uh, in hot hits, you have hits in hot, right? So no, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying pure Martin Luff type theory with identity types right. as formalized, you know, as given to us from on high. That system has infinitely many levels of identity proofs. Well, you can you you can always write the type of identity, but it might be the case that it's it's completely degenerate. It, it doesn't take but it's position. Not, the point is, it's not always completely degenerate. As soon as you yeah, have no, a universe, for example, when you have universes, for example, you can prove that there are non-degenerate ones. So, yeah, you can. Well, 
in MLTT. No, it's compatible with K. So you cannot prove if if you if you don't have any additional principle. Yeah, but we don't put it. But we don't put in anything to get the higher to get the higher identity proofs. Okay, I think we've reached an impasse here. Right. Sorry. Okay. Good. Let's. Uh, do we have any more questions? Okay. So there are no more questions. So thanks very much for your talk. Thank you. um, now the next speaker is Paige, and she's doing the um, structure identity principle. She's asked to move the talk back so that her co-author can be present. And I think that's great as long as the others in the session agree. So here's uh, a brief moment for anyone to object, and otherwise we're going to do that. So the other two speakers would be, let me just find them here, uh, would be Christina, who is probably on board with this, I hope, and Niels. Oh, there's three more speakers, Christina, Niels, and Peter Salinger and company. Everybody okay with that? Well, if I'm next, then I object. Oh, Christina, no. come on. No. Good job. no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. The 10 minutes are not going to make it or break it. Um, okay, great. So thank you, Christina. So let's, yeah, thanks. Move, let's move Christina up. And that'll be next then. We're going to talk about sequential co-limits in homotopy type theory. And our presenter is Christina Sayakova, And her co-authors are Floris Van Dorn and Egbert Rijka. So... Um, I think one of them may even be on board, or maybe even both. Yes. I'll, so I proudly mention this is one of our great CMU teams. So thanks, you guys. Okay, Christina, take it away. Right. Thank you. Yes. So, so this work, in fact, originated at at CMU uh, when uh, Egbert asked me uh, if I could fill in a proof of a lemma that he initially. Um, wrote as straightforward in his original write-up mm -hmm. and it resulted in an paper <laughs> later on. Uh, so, right, so um, this is, the, the paper in general is about the development of um, what we call sequential um, co-limits, but in the literature, is especially in domain theory, is also known as uh, direct limits, uh, which are, um, homotopy co-limits of, of a very simple diagram that just consists of a, a chain of types and uh, functions that allow us to go from type n to type um, type at level n to type at level n plus one. Um, and then we impose some gluing where we say that um, if we, that any, if we inject an element from type at level n, and that's the same thing as injecting the lifting uh, if we carry over the element to um, the next level and inject it from there into the colimit, then um, these two injections are identified. Um, so despite its simplicity, uh, this type of construction occurs um, all throughout, for example, the semantics of programming languages um, in the construction or, or in the char alternative characterization of um, Scott's model um, of untyped lambda calculus, the infinity, um, and so on. And um, they are very useful, uh, especially because we have a lemma um, in the semantics of programming languages that says that if a certain endofunctor preserves colimits of this form, then um, it has initial algebras and they can themselves be explicitly described um, as sequential colimits. So in a recursive manner like this. And of course, there's a, a bunch of work in the literature um, on, on, the, on this topic, except um, a lot of it, as is the case with most of the synthetic homotopy type theory, a lot of it relies on a very much prior development that is, would be very difficult to encode directly, which is why we use um, the synthetic approach and use homotopy type theory to um, reason about th these things at a more um, axiomatic level. And um, so the, ma the majority of um, the work that we did is in fact towards proving a s one major technical lemma, which says that uh, homotopy co-limits or sequential co-limits um, in homotopy type theory appropriately commute with sigma types that correspond to a certain type of limits. 
uh, in the semantics. And this lemma turns out to be incredibly useful for a variety of things. One can prove a whole bunch of uh, axioms, a whole bunch of consequences, um, such as the commutation of sequential columns with loop spaces and with identity types and with the properties of truncatedness and connectedness. And all of these proofs are basically very short and uh, relatively painless. And uh, good. Yes. So somebody asked me to share a video. Uh, I don't see but, that. Okay. Maybe maybe I'll just ignore it. Okay. I so the uh, question of whether you're sharing something on a screen that we can't. I am see. not. I assume you're just talking. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm just talking. That's fine. Uh, I'm actually on the phone. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So okay. Let's continue. So right. So so um, most of the work was. Um, went towards proving this theorem and uh, I guess the novelty in the proof itself is that it's it basically starts from it's, it's completely elementary in the sense that it only uses the appropriate induction principles that are available from hot um, and in particular the, the semantic proof relies very heavily on the on the language of you know category theory obviously and um, working specifically with uh, you know, topological spaces, for example. Uh, we, of course, don't do any of that. Um, all of it is uh, purely type theoretic, purely syntactic, and um, of course, formalized in a variety of proof assistants. I think now we have formalizations in Lean, uh, Cock. Uh, yeah, maybe Lean and Cock so far. Uh, and the formalizations are actually pretty short, maybe in the order of 300 lines of code. Um, so, uh, right, so, so this, this technical lemma then allows us to give very short and elegant proofs of a variety of interesting corollaries. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of this work, some of, some of this work is useful for um, a lot of the development that, for example, Dan Christensen um, has been doing and also uh, on some further work that Egbert carried out on localization. Okay. Um, yes, and so uh, currently we are thinking about how to extend the work to, for example, carry out the construction of the infinity in hot, whether that's possible or not. Nice. Okay. So that's it for me. Great. Okay, that's terrific, Christina. Thanks. Uh, I agree. This is very interesting work. Um, let's see if anyone has any questions about it. So there was a question on Slack from Niels. Someone is someone uh, forwarding Slack questions into the chat. The, uh, about David, David Janssen was doing that. That way, we don't have to keep changing applications. David, are you doing that for us, or should we check the Slack? David seems to be busy. I've just forwarded the question from Slack okay. into the chat, and it's a question by Niels. So perhaps he wants. Yeah, maybe Niels can just go ahead and ask it himself. Niels. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, so the question I have was basically aimed at where you can extend your results for arbitrary well-ordered types, because um, if you want to use uh, this result to construct certain initial algebras, then uh, only relying on co-limits of the natural numbers is not enough, because sometimes you need bigger co-limits. So. I was wondering whether you think you can extend this result to uh, arbitrary well or types and whether, and if that is the case, whether you expect there to be any uh, significant difficulties. Um, well, am I still unmuted? Okay. Uh, hi. Okay. Um, so um, one question that I would have here is that even in the construction of, even to state the, the lemma, yeah. we were using a pro the a property of natural numbers, which is that every natural number has a unique successor. Um, so this would not, I guess I'm not exactly sure how one would in fact formulate a corresponding uh, lemma yeah. for an arbitrary well-ordered type. I guess now you have maybe another case for successors yeah. or for limits. 
yeah, so it, it is not clear to me that one, at least there isn't, there doesn't seem to be an obvious way how to, how to even formulate the lemma. Um, You'd need another part of your lemma to carry the... Right. I have a quick question, unless there's somebody else who's got an urgent one. Um, one, of the yes. things we, one of the things we use sequential co-limits for in uh, kind of basic programming semantics theory is to construct initial algebras for, say, uh, polynomial endofunctors. We iterate, 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 and pretty, mm -hmm. soon, pretty soon in the grand scheme of things, we reach a limit, and if the polynomial endofunctor has a small signature, then that will be a fixed point. So, for example, you can use that to construct the W types uh, just from the natural number index along. So I suppose we Correct. can prove internally that if you just have natural numbers and you have your theorem, then you have W types for all small signatures. Did you guys do that? That's, that's true. So my, my question, I have a qu counter question on, oh. um, on that. So for example, in, I think in your book, wasn't there a restriction that um, each of the operators has to be finite yeah, that's what, what I meant w by small w signature. That's what I meant. By oh, small. okay, by small. Yeah, then I agree. Yeah, if you mean by yeah. small. But did you guys do it? It would be a nice little exercise to uh, prove the value of your theorem. We have actually started. So I was working on this with Alex Cavos, actually. He was the one who suggested this follow-up. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, there is already a germ of a cock formalization of this. Great, result. okay. Great, glad to hear that. Okay, shall we move on, guys, or guys and gals? Is there any further question? Okay. I have a comment on Neil's question, and I think Eckbert has uh, worked on equifibrant replacement for arbitrary graphs mm -hmm. and uh, dependent graphs over an arbitrary graph. So I think it's probably doable to uh, to generalize this lemma for arbitrary graphs like uh, uh, larger, well-ordered types. Uh, but I don't think he has, uh, we have done it yet. Uh, I, just, well, I don't think Eckbert has done it yet. Okay. Thanks, Flores. And thanks Thank you. Coming. Okay. So let's move on then. So now we are skipping Paige because uh, she got moved to the end. And that means we're doing uh, Niels is going to do uh, higher inductive types as groupoid quotients. Yes. Okay. Then I like share. this topic. Go ahead. Then first, try to see whether I can share my screen, mm -hmm. which I think I think my screen is shared right now. Yep, looks good. Okay, and we I'll... can hear you fine. So just okay. Charge. Okay, let's start then. Yep, please do. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night, everybody. Thank Choose you. the one fitting your time zone. And I will tell you something about my paper, which is about high, which is about high inductive types as groupoid quotients. So let me recall the main points of the paper and also explain a bit about the, about the, about the context of it. So high inductive types are one of the core features of homotopy type theory. And the main idea of homotopy type theory is that we interpret all the, all the basic things in a bit different way. So for example, types, we see types as spaces, terms of a type we see as points in a space, equalities between two terms we see as paths, and paths between paths we see as homotopies. And one of the interesting thing of homotopy type theory is high inductive types, because they allow us to, uh, to define types by, spe by specifying constructors for points, paths, and homotopies. So this is an extension of inductive types. So for example, the natural numbers is an inductive type, which is specified by uh, two constructors for points of this type. So we have a constructor for zero and a constructor for a successor. But in a high inductive type, we can also specify an uh, equation. So if we would go, for example, for the natural numbers module two, we have, again, the successor and the zero. And then we can get, uh, we also add a constructor which says that n plus two equals n. And we can also add higher constructors between, uh, which are homotopies. For example, if we have like, we have two proofs that n plus three equals n plus one, 
we can either use this path directly or we use that, uh, uh, we, we apply the successor map to this path. And then we can, for example, say that these two equations are equal. So that is the uh, extra, extra expressivity of higher inductive types. So I'm, I will uh, restrict my attention to a certain kind of types, namely uh, one types. And these are types whose homotopies are trivial. So if you think about the type, we have uh, the points with, yeah, so just the points, the terms of the type. Between them, we have pods. And between the pods, we have homotopies. And in a one type, all these homotopies are the same. And so one types are a bit similar to groupoids. So the points in the one types are the objects of the groupoid, and the pods are the morphisms of the groupoid. And all the groupoid operations and law hold because they do. And the main question I had is, can we construct a class of high inductive types using the groupoid quotient? So the overall idea I would have is like, uh, we have the whole, we have this definition of high inductive types, which is rather complicated. Can we get them all from a simple high inductive type, namely the groupoid quotient? So what does the groupoid, what does the groupoid quotient do? It takes a groupoid and turns it into a one type. And yeah, so the objects of the groupoid are the points of that one type, and the morphisms become the paths in, in that one type. And yeah, so that was what I was looking at. And you can also see this question in a different way, namely, what kind of high inductive types can we construct from the groupoid quotient? Yeah. So question time, I guess. Okay, you finished? Yes. Good, thanks. Thanks for keeping it short. I know it's difficult for everyone to make such a brief summary of work that you spent a year on, but uh, I think you've all done a great job so far. It reminds us what was in the talk that we've already all watched. So maybe someone has a question. If not, I've got a couple. So maybe I'll get started just to get the conversation, get the ball rolling here. Um, let me look up mine again. <coughs> So of course, one thing is the, the question that you asked at the end there about uh, which higher, uh, higher things can be done in this way. One way to do it would be to have higher groupoids, maybe two groupoid quotients or yes. three groupoid quotients. But as, as someone who's also worked on this topic, you and I know how hard it gets once the groupoids get higher than even one. Yes. And so that seems less tractable somehow mm -hmm. to do it by hand the way you've done it here because it requires great ingenuity. Um, however, there are some things that are like, they're one groupoids and the quotient turn, or yeah, the quotient turns out to be a one type, but you don't have to truncate it. It's just naturally is a one type, like the circle, right? You take Z, you build DZ and you get the circle, but it's, you can prove then that the higher levels are all trivial. So that's a fascinating phenomenon there. It would be nice to get a better handle on that, like which things without the truncation are naturally bounded in dimension. Do you have any insight into that, having now thought hard about this kind of thing? Yeah, so there's a reason why I uh, naturally did not uh, came to a question like that, because I... Uh, I tend to be interested in high inductive types with recursion. So in, if I talk about high inductive types, I do want to treat them with recursion. And then if you have like a recursive path constructor, you get uh, this recursive path constructor has to be well-defined. So you can apply it to itself. So for example, you have a path constructor for all X, blah, 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 call it P. Then you can talk like uh, up DP on that path constructor itself. So then you get a two path. And so you get uh, a lot of higher uh, paths because it, when you allow this recursion. So if you allow recursion, you have to, uh, you have to do truncation because otherwise you, are, you force yourself to work with, uh, you force yourself to work with uh, higher group points. Mm, I so, see. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, what is, if I throw in a bunch of dummy higher stuff? Mm -hmm. Uh, which doesn't really add any junk. You, you want to be able to distinguish between that and ones where the recursion really does something. So, well, 
That's the question, right? It's not something you can just read off the syntax, I think. Or maybe you can, I don't know. Re hey, sorry, can I, uh, what do you mean with read off the syntax? What kind of read off the syntax? Whether the result is going to have essentially higher dimensional stuff or yeah. just some dead higher dimensional stuff that's all yes. contractible anyway. Yes, I think when you have a recursion, like recursive paths, you will have a by the, you will have uh, the non-trivial higher stuff, I think. Well, not so, always. Okay, well, okay not always. Tr truncation <laughs> itself is a recursive higher inductive type, so. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good example. Yeah, yeah okay, that, okay, you're right. It, it, okay, it, it's not always, but uh, you tend to have, a, it tend to occur the uh, higher stuff, so. That's, well, could be, uh, yeah. Okay, I have a different question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it looks like the Hoffman Streicher groupoid model, uh, which is just a model of type theory without any hits, admits groupoid quotients. I think you'll agree to that. Oh, wait, wait. Can I make a side remark quickly? So sure. uh, there's a paper by DPR and Montclair, and they constructed within the Hoffman Streicher groupoid models a class of higher inductive types. So yeah. I think this model does. Uh, admit higher inductive types. Yeah, of course it like does. Yes. Of, cor of course it does. Yes. It admits, for example, groupoid quotients. Yes. Okay. So um, my uh, question was something else. It also looks like it's probably the free completion of the set model under the addition of groupoid quotients. So is that something you might be able to prove using your setup? I don't expect you to answer that off the top of your head, but um, just a comment. I think that's actually an interesting question because if you want, so I, I okay, I tend to uh, formalize everything I do because I just do that. So if you want to formalize that, you would need to have within type tier some way of uh, comparing models. So uh, then, you, uh, yeah, Which so you, what, you do, I, what you do in your paper. Yes, but yeah, so I would also uh, want to have some kind of notion of uh, categories with families or comprehension categories, which uh, also allow for higher models like the groupoid quotient, and then I think you can uh, uh, <laughs> make such a comparison. And yeah, that's what I'm suggesting. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. No other questions. Maybe we'll say thanks, and we'll move on. Thank you. Okay. Great. So our next talk in this fascinating session is. Let me look at my thing here. Ah, oh, great, Peter Sollinger and company. So this is linear dependent type theory for quantum programming languages. And uh, we're running three minutes behind on the clock, so I'm gonna ask the remaining two people to each shave 90 seconds off your time. Okay, please go ahead. I think Peter begins. I'm not sure who's doing the quick presentation though. So uh, I will. Who is actually the... in okay, great, it's Frank. Okay, thanks. I don't know if all three of you are going to try to tag team this part too, but are you just going to do it yourself? Uh, you'll be all of us, but I'm sharing my great. Okay, screen great. right now. Uh, can you hear me and see the slides? Yes. Good, good. Yeah, so my co so I'm Frank Wu, and my co authors are Kohei Kishida and Peter Selinger. Mm -hmm. And so our goals for this paper is to develop technique for reasoning about quantum programs. And we approach this goal by uh, using the theory of programming languages. And more specifically, in our case, we are focusing on high level language, which is essentially strongly typed uh, functional programming language. And we, be we believe that uh, uh, language should have a well-defined mathematical meaning uh, independent of uh, the implementations. So uh, in our paper, we talked about uh, this version of Creeper, which we call Proto-Creeper. It's a type-safe version of the programming language called Creeper. So Creeper is an embedded language in Haskell uh, it's a circuit description language, but it's not type safe. 
So ProtoKeeper is supposed to be the tie safe version of Keeper. So our most recent development for ProtoKeeper is that we are adding a linear dependent type for ProtoKeeper, which our paper, uh, so in our paper, we discuss how we achieve this, right? So a quick summary of our paper, uh, we propose the notion of state parameter vibration as the denotation you know, semantics. Uh, we have operational semantics. Uh, we show soundness and tie safety. Uh, we also have a prototype available. And last, a quick advertisement. Uh, we'll have a live tutorial session on reversible computation this Friday. Yeah. Great. OK. Thanks very much, and thanks for holding it short there. I'm sorry to cut your time a little bit sh short, but I think that was a good summary of your excellent presentation. Um, if, you, if you folks haven't seen the presentation, I urge you to do it. These guys definitely should win the award for the best video presentation. They did a nice job, and it was very kind of informative and relaxing with Peter Salinger sitting on his couch. So... Um, I, there are a couple of questions in the chat here. So uh, one is, of course, praise, praise, praise. And then the question, uh, so I'll, I'll summarize. The praise, though, is also, um, it's been a longstanding and difficult problem to integrate linear with dependent types. You guys seem to have done it. Um, I'm convinced it looks good to me, and other people seem to agree too. And uh, the question is now, where do we go from here? What are the main challenges that remain to formalize proto Quipper D into Quipper? How? What do you have to do? What remains to be done to get it to be a, not just a proto type? So, uh, on the one hand. This implementation of of protoquipper that Frank made uh, is is I mean to me it's already totally amazing because it's almost like it's like um, Haskell with dependent types or Agda with with type classes or something. It, it's got it's got like all of these features together. But if you if you um, if you try to program in this, you find that it's still you know um, there's still a, a lot of things that you know, are sort of missing. Once the the linearity, um, you know, linearity is a kind of modality, similar to um, uh, what was talked about in the first talk of this session. And uh, and there's a that means it can be awkward for the programmer because in every type of everything that you program, you have to annotate, uh, you, you have to explicitly say um, where the modalities are. And so you have these force and lift operations. And in the implementation, they're often sort of inferred automatically. But then there are strange things that you have to do. So sometimes you have to ADA expand a term, for example, because otherwise it won't type check. And that's because its implicit type might have a modality somewhere, you know, deeper down where you don't see it if you don't ADA expand. So that's, that's one thing um, we're still working on is to sort of make it more usable, to make some of these things more Dramatic. And there's a feature called dynamic lifting that Quipper has, where, you know, like the whole point of Proto Quipper and the semantics that we gave is to really separate circuit generation time from, from circuit, circuit execution time. Uh, so that nothing that happens at circuit execution time could sort of leak back into the, in, into, you know, nothing that's a state could leak, leak back into a parameter. But then actually sometimes you want to do that. So there are some quantum algorithms that require you to execute, let's say the first 15,000 gates, and then you do a measurement. And based on the outcome of that measurement, you decide what the next 15,000 gates should be. So that we call that dynamic lifting because something that happens at circuit runtime would actually have to be imported back and then be used to generate the next part of the circuit. Okay, thanks, Peter. That's a long answer. Sorry. Okay, yes. thanks very much, though. I think that people got the idea of what's, what's left to do. I'm going to allow myself to give one more quick question, and that is probably for Kohei. What's an example of a setup, like in your semantics, 
with the uh, monoidal category over an LCC. And I'll ask maybe what I hope it is, is sheaves of modules. Is it, would something like that satisfy your setup? Um, e, well, I'm not, sorry, I'm not so sure about uh, sheaves you, of modules. You want, a, you want the monoidal business for the linear thing and then mm -hmm. a vibration over an LCC. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, um, or do you, have some, do you have a different example that you can tell me quick? Oh, what? so um, so the one particular example we were uh, taking advantage of a lot is a uh, this a uh, uh, this category called the M double bar that has been used in a previous setting of a uh, proto quipper. So from from a uh, uh, that's that's a uh, sort of a, you, so you start from a uh, um, sort of a monoidal category any monoidal category okay. uh, actually uh, of uh, that you want to model then you take we take a uh, sort of a, 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 a co completion. Uh, no, sorry, um, co-product com uh, completion of a uh, that category. That's okay. that's going to uh, give a uh, uh, sort of a throw in uh, a lot of a. Uh, um, so basically, basically, it's sort of a uh, taking a uh, um, uh, the uh, any sort of a co-product co co completion is going to take a uh, vibration over sets. So that that's going to uh, give a uh, very concrete model, and that turns out to a uh, uh, model a uh, proto creeper. I mean previous. Uh, proto creepers, and now now we, we can extend the uh, proto creep. Okay, thanks. I'm I'm looking for an answer that doesn't have the word quipper in it, like oh, sheaves, sure. like sheaves of modules. I urge you guys to come up with a example that is some naturally occurring mathematical structure. Okay, thanks. But thanks, nice work. I think it's a breakthrough. This is a paper that will be cited in the future. I think. And uh, again, thanks for that great presentation. So let's go on. We have uh, eight minutes remaining for Paige. This is the price you pay, Paige, for having moved your talk to the last end of the session. Please carry on right away. Yep. Okay. So let me share my screen. Good. Um, okay. So uh, just to summarize quickly, our motivation was to generalize these results that were already known in, in homotopy type theory. So in the hot book, um, there's a result known as the structure identity principle. Um, a large number of those cases subsumed in the hot book were already proven by Kokan and Danielson. And so for example, um, they proved that if you have two groups, quality um, the identity type between this, those two groups is the same thing as um, the normal notion of group isomorphism that you would um, try to write down in homotopy type theory. So these two notions, the kind of um, internal notion of equality in type theory, in, at least in martin Lift type theory, and um, the notion of isomorphism coincide, um, if you include the univalence axiom. And then this um, automatically gives us um, the fact that if we have two isomorphic, isomorphic groups, then they have all the same properties, which is something that um, a group theorist might even just take for granted without um, proving every time, but in type theory, it is always true. Uh, and then there's a, a higher version, so not for set-based structures, but um, for slightly higher structures for categories, um, Aaron Skopolkin and Shulman showed that if we have not any two categories, but two what they call univalent categories, C and D, and we have still the univalence axiom, then we can prove a similar thing which is that um, the equality between these two categories, um, the normal equality notion that's given by Martin Luff, is the same as um, the notion of categorical equivalence. And then this um, automatically implies that if we have two um, categories that are equivalent, then they must have all the same properties, which is certainly a useful thing when you're doing category theory. So we wanted to um, generalize this to higher notions of structures, higher structures, um, more structures, and get, um, so a, first of all, a class of higher structures defined in a particular way, um, and then a notion of univalence that we can automatically um, extract from our description of the structure, and then also a notion of equivalence um, between two such structures, which validate um, a principle that looks like this, so the identity and the notion of equivalence should coincide. And then that will automatically validate a structure identity principle by which I mean something like this. So if we 
know that two univalent structures are um, equivalent, then we know they have all the same properties. Um, so we did this and we used um, a lot of ideas from Mackay and this earlier paper on univalent categories. And uh, the last thing I want to say is that in our, um, we don't have too many examples in the extended abstract for Lix, but in the preprint on the archive of an extended version, we do have a lot of um, examples giving the notion of structure for different higher categorical structures um, and, and what the notions of equivalence and univalence are there. And that's it. Great. Okay, thanks Paige. That was brief, but to the point. Uh, we have a question here from Niels, so I'll let him ask that himself. He's present. Okay, uh, so my question was basically the following. So when I looked at the preprint thingy, uh, I noticed that you work in a two-level type theory. So I think, to, if I understood correctly, the reason was uh, to be able to deal with higher coherencies. And so my question is, if I don't want to work in a two-left type theory, I want to work in normal hot, how far can I come? Can I, for example, uh, still prove as structure identity principle for something like bi-categories or stuff like that? Yeah, so the reason we work in two-level type theory is to um, be able to make a theory for every structure at once. So it's very similar to the problem of defining like um, semi-simplicial types that was handled in the two-level type theory paper. Um, so if you have a, a particular structure that you're interested in, so say by categories, or even if you just have a particular level, like you're just interested in like level um, four structures, which is a notion defined in our paper, then you can do it without um, two level type theory. Yeah. So it's just to handle, like to talk about every kind of structure all at once. We needed this framework. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if there's another question, letting the Slack play out a little bit. Okay, so we're coming up against the time. We have only three minutes remaining. I'll ask the same question I always ask you when I hear this talk. I've asked you, or one of you, giving this talk, this question, uh, I think two or three times now. Each time, my, I hope my question gets a little bit better because each time the answer is, oh, you're mixed up about blah, blah, blah. And then I realized, oh yeah, I'm kind of mixed up about that. So I'll try again though. Now my question is this, can we do the same thing? It's related to the last question. With a sig so with a signature in Martin Luff type theory, the folds signatures are maddeningly simplified. They're just relational signatures. That's nice because it has this reedy like description as a directed category and so on, but in real logic and in real mathematics, we like the signatures to have operations too, not just relations. And what the heck, why not also dependent functions and so on? Because those things are good mathematical structures too. And they also have this property we all know secretly without the proof that they have it. So can you extend your theory to include also theories with richer signatures involving function types? Well, so, um, so we have these, these uh, signatures, which are like these kind of tree like structures yeah. I'm making this motion. And um, uh, so, yeah, everything is required to be relational. I mean, like, um, yeah, that's we're what... thinking of them as relations, but then we um, want to impose axioms, like for example, the axioms for categories um, on the signature for categories, but then for any um, one of those objects that stands for what we expect to be a function, we will impose axioms saying that it's a function, that the relation is actually functional. I'm not sure if that gets to your question. Well, it sounds like a proof or a sketch of a proof that you could do this for signatures with function types. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, yeah, we like later um, a posteriori impose the requirement that the, these relations are functions. Yeah, but you could bury right that on. ugliness under the hood and state the theorem in terms of signatures with function types, more familiar signatures. Yeah, yeah it, would, it would take some work to formulate yeah. exactly what a signature of that kind is and then formulate a, a precise translation into the relational ones. Uh, yeah, but we haven't would, done yeah, that. Would it would give you a better theorem because it would talk about more familiar things like first order logical signatures. So it could be done, and probably it can be extended to high, all higher types. Anyway, thanks for the answer. So we're done. Yeah, we're out of time, guys and gals. Thank you, Paige. 
Thank you, Mike. Yep. Thank, you. thank you. All the speakers. Let's take a little moment here to thank all the speakers in this session. I think it was really interesting. I learned stuff. Now I invite you to join us for a drink of your own, <laughs> bring your own uh, at the social gathering. If it's early morning for you, bring your coffee. If it's late at night, bring whatever. See you at the social thing. There's a, a link in the chat. Thanks again. Bye-bye, everybody.